Dangerous Regency Romance. This is a novella. It's a Regency novel, a romance novel. And this was um, written in 2017. This is chapter one. Albany Bachelor Hotel, Card Gangster Room, London, England, Monday, February 21st, 1814. There once were two dashing young dukes living in the Albany Bachelor Apartments for aristocrats in London, England. One we shall call Duke Griffin Naismith, the other we should call Duke Rupert Steedman. Names aren't important in these types of stories. What is important is the impact of the characters' doings. For the two dukes met over a card game and came to a competitive conclusion, shocking to their bachelor male peers. Duke Griffin Naismith said, So you suppose yourself a better man, a better lover, and a better husband than I? I do, said Duke Rupert Steedman. That is saying a lot, murmured the small group of men. I am, started Duke Rupert Steedman, most excellent in all things dueling, picking racehorses at the Ascots, even walking the higher wire in, this, in circus gyms. Walking the higher wire, you say, Duke Rupert Steedman. That's an undignified sort of thing, my good fellow, for a tongue member. No, 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 I propose. Duke Griffin Naismith stopped for a second. <clears throat> I propose we meet again in private and decide the terms of our competition. Duke Rupert Steepman turned to his esteemed peers, Dukes, visit counts, marquees, and counts. Not here. Not among our peers. Why, who shall be the judge of our success? Smiling and smug, Duke Griffin Naismith replied, our peers and their peers. Finally, Duke Rupert Steedman understood and flashed a wry smile. I do get your meaning, he chortled. I do get your meaning. Duke Rupert Steedman laughed. Duke Griffin Nasmith laughed. All the other aristocrats in the Ton Bachelor Albany apartment started laughing. <laughs> but they had no real factual clue what Duke Griffin Naismith meant. They only liked the idea. Somehow, they get to decide the winner of the contest. Later on, Duke Griffin Naismith and Duke Rupert Steedman met in private in the Shire of Devon, foreign to the both of them. They were not well known and went unnoticed. The two dukes decided these terms. Duke Griffin Naismith would choose the marriage partner for Duke Rupert Steedman, and Duke Rupert Steedman would return the favor to Duke Griffin Naismith. Smiling and smug, Duke Griffin Naismith said, she is beautiful, probably virginal too. Her composure is ton-like. Her looks can launch a regional skirmish, perhaps, something between two minor powers of state. She loves to wear the color of peach and looks fine in it. I must say. But Duke Griffin Naismith paused and rubbed his bare chin. Duke Rupert Steedman, impatient to know his future wife, said, Get on with it, man. Do not fret, my gut fellow. At the competition, none stands in your way. She is non tong Duke Griffin Naismith paused again, adding finally, She is a mulatto. Duke Griffin Steedman gasped in horror. Before you object and give me the victory outright, Duke Rupert Steedman, given all that it is said about this particular mulatto woman, I want to add, if she were not so slightly mixed, I'd marry her myself. And only in the sunlight would anyone notice Constanza's difference of race, Duke Rupert Steedman. I think you have the far easier choice in a wife than I. Duke Rupert Steedman wanted to hand over the large sum of money. Someone thousands of pounds right then and there. But as their meeting was private, he figured who would know. I have to marry her and stay married? 
do Griffin Naismith in a stoic voice reply, what good is a wager broken? That given as it is, Duke Rupert Stevens started slowly thinking, pondering the future wife of his peer. That given as it is, I've got a most excellent choice for you, Duke Griffin Naismith. A ton woman, not too ugly, not too pretty either, who turned into a spinster some three years prior. Semester Lady Eleanor Watson is well off financially. Her diary could launch her war. Duke Rupert Stevens chuckled. Spinster? You chosen for me to marry a spinster? This spinster Lady Eleanor Watson of Hampshire? Cricky, retorted Duke Christmas, Kristen Griffin Naismith. You are a sly, mean sort of fellow. For I have to live with this woman the rest of my life? We, Duke Rupert gestured his forefinger to himself, and then Duke Griffin have to stay married. Duke Rupert Stephen corrected. It is fair. Smiling and smug, Duke Griffin Naismith simply shrugged his shoulders. Duke Rupert Stephen asked, but when shall we declare the winner? Confident Duke Griffin Naismith gave his reply, six years hence from today, February 21st, 1820. Duke Griffin Naismith hurriedly added, you are free to end the bet right now, Duke Rupert. Duke Rupert Stephen said, that's a long, long time. Napoleon will surely be defeated by then. Duke Rupert Naismith replied, we hope, Duke Rupert Stephen, we hope. And sadly, King George III will have passed away by that time too. The two dukes shook hands on the matter and both pulled out Cuban cigars and drank a toast. To marriage, adventure, and mystery. Duke Rupert Steepman wickedly replied, most assuredly, the spinster's mystery. Duke Griffin Naismith cautiously replied, the brazen mulatto mystery. Both dukes concluded their bet after vowing not a word to a soul other than God, and not in a confessional sense. No one must know of our reason for marrying the woman of our choice. He who tells forfeits the bet. And so it was. The two dukes wooed and won their respective women and married them in two separate ceremonies. Duke Griffin Naismith married sister Lady Eleanor Watson of Hampshire. Duke Rupert Steedman married the Milano woman, Constanza, who served as a servant woman for... Countess Heathcote in London. Both fans surprised at the merit choices of the other. They moved out of the Albany apartments, were staying there and merely increased the chances of revealing their why of their bet choices. Each settled down to a life of marriage, taking strolls in Hyde Park, visiting the convent theater with their wives, attending museums and country dance balls. Here too, May 14, 1814, Assembly Rooms, Almax, King Street, London, England, evening, Saturday, May 15, 1814. I don't see why I can't attend the Assemblies of Almax, Countess Dorothy Beckendorf. Why, you yourself are a foreigner, a Russian, and look how quickly you have risen in time society, Duke Rupert Stephen said to the attractive dark curly locks society patroness of Almax. Her oval face and long nose that mark of Russian beauty and her big black eyes invited one to fall inside of them. Reveal all your secrets. Dear Duke Rupert Steedman, I understand your disappointment. Russia has had disappointments, but these are things to get over and get on with life. I'm sure many balls and dances will accept Duchess Constanza. Oh, oh dear, there's Duke Seabrook. He must have something important to say to me. Duke Rupert Steedman smoldered as he and Duchess Constanza retreated from the Almax on King Street. Don't worry, Duke Rupert, said Constanza. One day we shall be full members of Tom's society, but right now all I want is to be married to you. And she kissed him. Small random gaps escaped the crowd. But by this time, Duke Rupert Stevens' marriage to the mulatto was no longer the gossip scandal it had been in the beginning. 
because Duchess Constanza conducted herself with their higher class and her intellect seemed no different than the other Tan women. Duchess Constanza had been a servant woman in the household of Countess Heathcote of London. Duchess Constanza found all things Tan worthy of acquiring. Her beauty, her light, light skinned beauty, reminded one of an Italian princess, in fact. Outside, Duke Rupert saw Duke Griffin Naismith and his Duchess exiting their Brougham carriage. Everyone clapped and spoke. Why, there is Duke Griffin Naismith, the most honorable Tan man. A true spirit of compassion and class, said another. Eleanor Watson seemed doomed to a life of loneliness before he married her. This is proof, said another Marquise, that God exists and protects those who are kind at heart. Duke Griffin Naismith and Duchess Eleanor Watson walked past Duke Rupert Steedman and Duchess Constanza, and Duke Rupert Steedman, in his righteous, angry move, almost didn't speak. Why, if it isn't Duke Griffin Naismith, old friend, if I offended you? No, not you. No, not at all, my good fellow, Duke Rupert Steedman looked back slightly at Countess Beckendorf talking to Duke Seabrook and, and her husband, Count Levin, the Russian ambassador. Just a small matter, actually. I won't fret over it. Where is that smiling smug Duke of long ago? Doug Duke Griffin Naismith into Duke Rupert Steedman's feelings and intellect, flashing a bright smile that brought his Duchess Constanza to a happier consonance. Duke Rupert Steedman said, I was thinking about you the other day. And here we met at the Almax. Aren't you going in, Duke Griffin said, smiling and smug. I and Duchess Eleanor plan on having a good time. He showed Duke Rupert his voucher. The Duchess Constanza gasped, for Duke Rupert never got a voucher, or rather could not obtain one, in the proper place. Thinking this is a mistake, he decided to show up in person. Perhaps Constanza Beckendorf's instructions were a mistake. Duke Rupert was certainly tongue. Duke Rupert chortled and laughed. He shook his head. No, actually, we have to attend another ball. Someone new came into town and hostess wants me to meet. Duke Griffin Naismith said after receiving a telling glance from his once spinster wife, Duchess Eleanor. Do not fret, my good fellow. Duke Griffin slapped Duke Rupert on the upper arm. Cheer up. Rumor has it Napoleon is about to be defeated at Waterloo. You do say... I've heard similar rumors. What a pleasant surprise, Duke Rupert commented, feeling better at having met his old friend. It appeared to Duke Rupert that Duke Griffin got the better end of their bet. Duke Griffin's Naismith's good standing in the tongue went up. Duke Rupert's own reputation went down. Duke Rupert found this not a sufficient reason for calling off the secret bet, however. He rather loved his mulatto wife, Costanza, and a hard talent in bed wiped out the memories of his earlier unmarried dalliances. Yes, he was happy, in a sort of satisfied, mysterious way. To marriage, adventure, and mystery, Duke Rupert Steepman replied, ending the conversation. He chortled for good measure. Smiling and smug, Duke Griffin replied, yes, to marriage, adventure, and mystery. The two dukes departed and went on with their lives. Later, they celebrated the war's end at a big party. Not at the Almax, but another important time hostess. Duke Rupert and his mulatto duchess were invited. At this country dance ball, Duke Rupert Steedman found himself a rather curious oddity, or shall we say his mulatto wife was a curious oddity. Everyone will expect her to trip up here and there on some fact of British history, or pronouncing a word, or even a full pop at dancing. None of these things happen. And the mystery of when Duchess Constantia would create her faux pas remained a hidden novelty of Tan society. Whereas with Duke Griffin Naismith, the mysterious novelty remained when he would tire of his spinster. For many assumed she lacked qualities of love and lust. However, the Duchess Eleanor was a normal woman who happened not to be married at a young age. Her war chest brought improvements to Duke Griffin's manor house. Expansions followed in land purchases, and of course that meant hiring more servants to work the land. Duke Griffin grew trees and fruits in Kentshire. His swath investments funded by Duchess Eleanor's war chest diary, which increased doublefold by the end 
of year one alone. Duke Griffin Naismith was happier. Duke Griffin Naismith was a happier time man by far. I love you, Duchess Eleanor. Your proof spinsters is a myth and a slur. Duchess Eleanor had tears in her small blue eyes, eyes that should have been larger given her triangular shaped face. Her nose was a little too long, but if you took in the bigger picture of her long brunette hair, thick and shiny, she had a special charming beauty after all. Nevertheless, things in both camps, hidden of course, bothered both Duke Griffin Naismith and Duke Rupert Steedman. We shall discuss Duke Griffin Naismith's annoyances first because most readers will assume Duke Rupert Steedman had the more difficult time of this bet. In fact, Duke Griffin Naismith fought off urges to quit his marriage six months into the secret agreement. See, Duke Griffin Naismith rather always fancied the pretty ladies, and as Duchess Eleanor was on the rather modest side of the beauty fence, he wanted to taste other beauties on the side. He fought off these moments night and day, especially at the balls, those precious few moments when Duchess Eleanor disappeared to do Tan Woman's stuff helping out the country ball hostess brought him the most pain. One is rather content in one's private quarters, but imagine being thrown into an environment with the most stunning women of the age, women young and vibrant, women whose blooms have not fallen off their faces. Take, for example, Lady Ava St. George. Her effervescent personality drew most men like honey on, on bread for even a hater of bread. Her bubbly voice and excellent dancing drew one's mind wonders how things in bed would be with Ava. Do Griffin Naismith never doubted. Once Spencer Duchess Eleanor showed him higher sights. But, and but was the question. Duke Griffin Naismith always wondered about the younger tongue women. Women so young they did not need perfume. Debuting women, naturally young, exuded an aroma of lust and desire. Duke Griffin even wondered about Duke Rupert Steepman's mulatto wife. Duke Griffin Naismith knew it was wrong, but he wondered how to stay married to Duchess Eleanor until 1820. Who knows what would happen in such a long time, Duke Griffin Naismith had offered. Duke Griffin had lots of offers, offers he never had in his bachelor days at the Almany Apartments for a rogue, adventuresome, tongue male aristocrat like himself. These tongue bachelors sympathized with his plight. Marrying a spinster was charity, they said. They constantly badgered Duke Griffin. Why did he do it? They remembered the bet from two years ago and inquired, Is this the bet you and Duke Rupert Steedman made? Smiling and smug, Duke Griffin and Naismith replied, On your life, do you think I'd marry a spinster to win money, to boost my pride? I am a tongue. I do things out of a noble sense of honor. No woman of good character, wealth, and standing in our tongue community should be sequestered because of her age. Each of us will age one day. Our wives, good fellows, will age. Our children will age. Tongue society will age as a new crop of younger tongue pushed us to the sidelines and the chairs in the country dance balls throughout England. Duke Griffin Naismith lied. Well, half lied. A well put half lie. Duke Griffin married Duchess Eleanor for her internal qualities and her wealth. Now, if only her external beauty stopped nagging him. This nagging, to be honest, was Duke Griffin's own making. Many a man divorced and married again to a woman of the exact same age as Duchess Eleanor. So why the gossip of spinsters still attached to her name? What did Duchess Eleanor do wrong in her prior life to make her become a spinster? Many disturbing questions arose in Duke Griffin as he searched for an excuse to do what his wicked heart and lungs wanted to do all along. Marry a young, vibrant, rich, respectable, intelligent tongue wife. At this point, his first choice of marriage dried away, long gone from him. Better to enjoy the fruits growing on your side of the fence than to fancy fruits on the other side. They would not taste any sweeter for having hopped the fence trespass to another's land and then taking a bit of forbidden fruit.
In Duke Rupert Steedman's camp, his problems were obvious. Most acts grudgingly with reservations and after looking in slant and questioned indirectly in small questions behind his back, if Duchess Constantia was tongue worthy. When they were alone in their big manor house on the north side of London, Duke Rupert Steedman was happy as a little boy with a room full of toys. Duchess Constantia marveled at how happy Duke Rupert Steedman was alone in her presence. They played in frog more like to neighborhood children, boy and girl, left alone to their devices and plans. They did all kinds of things nung tongue. They sat on the floor in Duke Rupert Steedman's large bedroom and ate crackers and jam. They read books to each other late into the night and not the classics or high literature, mind you. They took baths together. He would finger comb her long black hair, brushing it with his fingers down the lightly tanned skin of her back. Together they climbed trees at night out in the formal garden. She told him tales, grandma tales about the West Indies and the Caribbean slaves and pirates and stolen loot, things she never saw in her life but persisted in her background from ancient relatives long gone and dead. Duchess Costanza was a mysterious woman and entirely entertaining. She brought entertainment as her wealth, not pounds and coin. This would be enough for Duke Rupert Steven, except for the persistent fact he had guests drop over. Their parlor doorman announced this ambassador or this member of parliament or merchant or land seller, speaking of big tracts of land available in Louisiana territories forfeited by Emperor Napoleon some years back. People who, upon seeing his duchess halted, gaps, found their thoughts frozen, as if they had met her by the door in the light. And Duke Rupert Steedman lived in constant annoyance of these important people withdrawing their support if Duchess Constanza accompanied them to the door. Thank God for doormen, main servants of the household doing these duties. Nevertheless, Duke Rupert Steedman wanted to merge the two worlds together. How? 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 Why they do such a thing? See, dear reader, Duke Rupert Steedman never thought about Duke Griffin Naismith's wife. So Duke Rupert had the advantage. Only if Duke Rupert Steedman could stop thinking about Taunt society, he'd be happy. Then he would be truly happy. Thoughts crossed Duke Rupert Steedman's mind of selling away abroad, away from England. He wondered if that was in their secret bet fair or was it legal to sell away. He trained as a barrister and as a lawyer, and he sought ways to wiggle out of the bet without being declared a loser. He laughed, too, too hard, and chortled, too, confidently to let Duke Griffin Naismith win this secret bet. But neither man knew the other wanted to break the bet, however. Both men held a 100% belief, given their flawed marriage mates, sooner or later the other tongue male in the bet would want to bolt to freedom. Perhaps Duke Rupert Steedman thought, I can encourage Duke Griffin Naismith to concede defeat first. On the southern side of London, Duke Griffin Naismith thought the same thing. What events to manipulate in Duke Rupert Steedman's life to make him give up the secret, dangerous romance bet? So that's chapter one of the dangerous Regency romance. A very exciting novella thriller that has an ending like no other. It has twists and turns that you want to imagine happening in, in a story like this, uh, Regency, and it, it keeps expanding and pulling in more and more characters. The, a very good read, very exciting, very fast read. It's just full of drama, you know, um, from both characters. From all four characters, the four main characters, two dukes and the two wives. So it is um, at cupidarisbooks.com, uh, littlecupidarisbooks.win, and at mylulu.com store. Go buy it. It's a great purchase, as uh, all the rest of my um, um, mega novels, novels, novellas, short story collections, and poetry collections. Thanks for listening and. Have a great day and subscribe to this YouTube channel. Thank you.